In Fayette County, there are approximately 10 opioid-related deaths each year and nearly double that in surrounding Coweta County. I'm Debbie Britt, member of the Fayette Chamber Board of Directors and a hospital administrator here in Fayette County. More importantly, I'm a parent who personally knows the devastating impact that opioid use can have on our children, our families, and our community. Watch as we share the story of a mother who suffered the ultimate loss. Gloria King, a registered nurse, shares her son David's battle with drugs in hopes that it will prevent other families from living through the nightmare of opioid addiction. Opioids, the generic name for a variety of pain relief medications which include Vicodin, Percocet, and Oxycontin. Opioids are defined by the United States as Schedule II drugs. By definition, Schedule II drugs have recognized medical use, often critical, but they also have high potential for abuse and addiction. This is the story of David King, a smart, likable young man with a bright future who grew up in Coweta County, Georgia. David became addicted to opioid pain medications. His story is also about the struggle and heartbreak his family endured as they tried to help him overcome his drug addiction. Growing up, David had a typical all-American kid life. Close family, friends, a good student, played sports. Uh, he was um, you're a typical boy, a very good child, very active, athletic. Never gave me really an ounce of trouble, just kind of normal with his siblings. Uh, he was talented, he was smart, he played the piano beautifully. He was very outgoing, he was my social child. He loved um, children and old people, and he would sit and talk with them, or play with a child in the neighborhood. So he was really good with people, and so he had a big heart, very big heart. You know, I had a beautiful family. I, they had a wonderful childhood. It was not even in my radar to think that I would have a son that could overdose. But at the age of 18, a visit to the dentist to have his wisdom teeth removed started a chain of events that changed his life and his family's forever. So he was uh, 18. Um, that January, this was in 2012, uh, he had his wisdom teeth pulled. And that's the first time that I remember that he was prescribed opiates. Um, being a nurse, I, I thought, uh, I kind of tucked it in the back of the, my brain that I thought he was given way too much for the amount of pain that I thought that he would have. And I also noted that he, he pretty much used them up. David's first introduction to pain medication would not be his last. Another medical issue arose that provided him with yet another dose of opioid pain pills. Then in May, he had an emergency appendectomy, um, and that is when uh, he got more opiates for that. David now had a precarious relationship with opioids. This could have been intensified by a teen environment that sometimes ignored the powerful risks associated with prescribed medications. One example of this is pill parties. So during his high school years, especially those last couple of years, you know, again, the boys and my daughter as well, my daughter didn't go to high school, she was homeschooled the rest of the way, but, um, so they, they were pretty open about what was going on, who was taking drugs, who was having sex, you know. They knew who the weed man was, they knew where to get the Roxy's from, um, Kids traded their Adderall or whatever other medication they were taking for ADD for whatever they wanted. Um, they even told me about they would have pill parties. 
and everyone would just bring whatever pills they could get or got from their parents' cabinets or from home. And they would put the pills all in a bowl. And so the party was that you're supposed to just grab what would have, was ever in the bowl and take it, not even knowing um, what you were taking. So he went off to school. Uh, he made straight A's that semester. He came home occasionally, but not, uh, not anything that comes to my mind that drew up any red flags. Uh, so he did come home for Christmas. And when he came home at Christmas time, you know, they have that long college break, he had lost a lot of weight. And he wasn't a big guy anyway, but he had lost 15, maybe more pounds. He was, he was very thin. Um, he was, you know, going out more, having some behaviors that uh, he didn't have before he went off to college. And so around January, uh, well, after Christmas, before January, um, trying to make a decision about whether he needed to go on back to school, he didn't, he just wasn't, things just weren't right with him. Um, he came home one day, and of course it was winter, and he had long sleeves on, and I can't remember how exactly I found the needle tracks on his arm, but I did. And I, you know, I don't know. I was just in perfect shock. So when he went off to college, it was easier to find heroin, and that is what he was using um, and injecting heroin. Percocet and, and other Vicodin, all these other opiate drugs that get you started on it, they're not as available. But you can buy a bag of heroin for about 10 bucks. And then, um, so then we started really having a, a real discussion about where he needed to go from here. And so decided um, he would not go back to school. Um, and really just stayed on him for a couple of weeks till he would go in for treatment. So David entered into a drug addiction program and seemed to be making progress toward a complete recovery. So he went to treatment. Uh, he was there for about two months. He looked great. Um, put some weight back on, ate a lot of uh, junk food while they were there. You know, really seemed to kind of have it together. So there was there was a, a, a small relief there. Um, but he wasn't home very long before he relapsed. And I, I don't think that he ever relapsed on heroin again. But when he moved back home, uh, it was easy for him to find Percocet again. It was easy for him to find prescription medications as long as he was at home. Uh, and he was crafty. He, he was a smart child. Um, there was a, one of his relapses was because he uh, went to our family dentist and told him he had a toothache and he wrote him a prescription for narcotics. Um, I had him going to a counselor. I had him seeing an addiction psychiatrist. He went to NA, he went to AA. Uh, those were all the only resources that I felt were available to me. And him and I kind of had an agreement. You know, it was starting to dawn on me that this was way more severe. You know, you don't wake up thinking that your 18 year old is gonna suddenly become addicted to drugs. But our agreement was that if he continued to struggle, that he would go back to rehab and then he would go into residential living. Um, um, it was very expensive. Uh, I spent all my money <laughs> over that, that year, um, which you know, I would have robbed a bank if I thought it would have saved his life. <clears throat> but he was also losing um, what dignity he had left. He could start to see 
what he had become versus what he was a year before. And I could tell that he hurt, that it was, it was a darkness for him, and he hated it. And he would say to me, Mama, I don't know what I've done, but this is not me, and I do not want to be an addict. And I always told him I was his best cheerleader. I would not leave his side. I would do whatever I needed to do to get him the help he needed. In spite of all of her efforts to help her son overcome his addiction, the struggle continued. Um, that whole next week was kind of a nightmare for me. Uh, every time he relapsed, he went down farther and had farther to come up. You know what I mean? Um, and for him, it was devastating. So part of me knows that during that week, that some part of him gave up, that he just didn't think that he was fixable. So uh, four or five days later after he'd been home, I had gone to work that day and when I came home from work, there was some kind of sketchy guys in the house. Some kids he went to school with um, in high school. And uh, I shooed them off and I could tell, already tell that he was messed up. And when I say that he was high on something, I, I could tell he was nodding off and um, not making sense, those kind of things. So he went to sleep and while he was sleeping, I searched the room for drugs um, and I found some fentanyl patches, um, prescription drug fentanyl patches. I took what I thought he had and I didn't really know how you used a fentanyl patch. You know, it's supposed to be something that you get a small dose th throughout several days. I had heard of kids um, cutting off a piece and chewing them. I'd heard a lot of things, but I'd never heard that you, there was a way that you could get a huge dose out of it. I mean, they were supposed to be manufactured for safety so that the reason why they were in the patch with so much so much narcotic in them is so that you couldn't get the full narcotic. And about 3.30 in the morning, my dog woke me up, which was unusual, barking and scratching at me. And so, uh, and it was David's dog too. David loved his dogs. And so I went to check on him. He was just a door down. And as soon as I walked in the room, I knew he was dead. Um, he was sitting up in the bed. But he was blue. When I touched him, he was cold. So I, I thought to do CPR, but I knew that it was beyond that. So I laid him down, um, called 911, called my parents, and uh, found out that um, he actually was singed a little bit around his nostrils. So he had taken another fentanyl patch and had smoked it. And that is the way that you get the full dose. Um, and if you know anything about fentanyl, it's used to put people to sleep when you uh, can breathe for them. So when he smoked it, he never had a chance. I mean, it, it caused him to stop breathing probably in a matter of seconds. Um, So it was in January of 2012 that he first um, had his wisdom teeth out and got his first opiates. So looking back two years from the time that he 
had uh, his wisdom teeth out, he, he was dead. David passed away on January 24, 2014. These are his mom's closing thoughts. I just think that people don't know, because some people can drink and some people can't, or some people can take pain medicine and stop. We so downplay the person who, whatever genetic part there is to the disease, you know, most people will even argue that there's, there's no disease. When you and I both know that it's something that once they get to that point, they gotta have it. And their mind can tell them over and over they gotta have it. So what I think he started out to do for fun, got him. To learn more about opioid addiction and prevention, contact Drug Free Fayette at drugfreefayette at gmail.com or by visiting us at www.drugfreefayette.org. This program was brought to you by Drug Free Fayette, Fayette Factor, AV Pride, and the following supporters.